we can absolutely just jump into jump into his theory of meaning. The first thing that we should tackle is his theory of truth. Because Donald Davidson fundamentally believes that a theory of meaning, a theory of what words mean, what sentences mean, all ultimately reduce down, quite simply, to a theory of truth. So from a theory of truth, you can just devise a theory of meaning. Now, obviously, then we have to talk about his theory of truth, and it's not super easy to talk about a theory of truth because it relies on a lot of confusing concepts. But again, I'll try my best to uh, to figure to, to explain it to you in a pretty simplistic manner. Essentially, then, Davidson is what is called a sentential primitivist, okay? And that's a really pretentious way to simply say that you cannot explain a theory of truth. The concept of truth is itself not explainable. And that means that for any attempt to explain truth, you are removing what truth actually is. And that is to say... Truth is just a deflationary concept that doesn't require any definition in the first place. When we recognize something as true, we know it is true, and that's really that. So he's rejecting, in this case, a correspondence theory of truth, which defines truth as uh, a statement is true if and only if it corresponds to the facts in the world. Um, he completely rejects that. He says, no, you're defining truth. You're trying to explain the concept of truth when truth itself is something that is not explainable in the first place, and putting it very simply, uh, truth is just what truth is. Now, that to you might seem like a cop-out, but for Davidson, it is something that is just intuitively clear. Because if we analyze any notion of truth, we can suddenly find a bunch of counterexamples to any stipulative definition of truth, um, that seems to give rise to the thought, well, maybe truth isn't something that can be defined in the first place. What is true is simply what is true. And this is not a super unpopular position. Deflationism about truth uh, is one of the most popular theories that there is now. Now, Davidson is not specifically a deflationist about truth because deflationism has connotations that Davidson doesn't agree with. But for simplicity's sake, we can just we can we can basically include his sentential primitivism, which is to say he takes truth as primitive um, into the group of theories that we call the deflationary theories of truth. OK, but that doesn't mean that truth is something that can't be analyzed in any way, because we can examine the role that truth plays in our language. And to do this. Davidson relies on the work of someone named Tarski. And Tarski wrote a very famous uh, paper, Alfred Tarski, called The Semantic Conceptions of Truth and the Foundations of Semantics. And Tarski's purpose in doing this was essentially to construct for any, for a for a formal language, for an artificial language that we would be using in mathematics, for example, we can rigorously define truth in a way that is not circular and that doesn't in evoke, invoke any other semantical concepts. Because you'll find that in all these other theories of truth, in the correspondence theory of truth, that truth is what corresponds to the facts, we start to invoke a bunch of other semantic uh semantic concepts that themselves are relying on truth to, un to be understood in the first place. So if we say something like, uh, we say truth is simply, uh, something is true if and only if its reference actually obtains. Well, all of a sudden we're invoking a semantic concept. We're invoking the notion of reference. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the term semantics, se semantics is simply concerned with the relationship that our words in our language have to the world. So reference is obviously a semantic concept because it's talking about the referent of a word to something in the world, or sense, or meaning 
itself is a semantic conception. So Alfred Tarski's project in devising his semantic conception of truth is to define truth in a manner that doesn't rely on other semantic concepts. Now, I disagree that he was able to successfully do this. I don't think that he's able to do this, and I'll try my best to explain why, but it definitely has its clear appeals, right? Because if we define truth in this manner, then we are not relying on a lot of these spooky concepts that other theories of truth need to rely on. So a correspondence theory of truth has to utilize concepts like reference and correspondence. And those terms rely on a lot of metaphysical notions about the mind's relationship to the world. And this is something that Alfred Tarski very much wants to avoid discussing. And Davidson is very much in agreement with this general line of thinking. And the other thinker that Donald Davidson is heavily influenced, perhaps more than anyone else by, is uh, W.V. Quine, Wilfred Van Orman Quine. Uh, and if you haven't read Quine, his magnum opus is probably, well, I don't want to call it his magnum opus. He, he has a lot of important works. But the, the best introduction work to, to Quine would probably be something like, word and object or something if you're interested in in quine but quine himself thought that meaning has no place in philosophy he he completely wanted to do away with the conception of meaning any attempt at a concept of meaning it's just not worth the time meaning meaning is irrelevant so in his philosophy of science he thought that meaning shouldn't play any role in the philosophy of science and any attempt to bring meaning into the philosophy of science is doing a disservice to the philosophy of science so now that we have that sort of background in the way, uh, let's examine how Davidson utilizes this primitive notion of truth and attempts to apply it to a theory of meaning. So for Davidson, everything starts with interpretation. And what do we mean by interpretation? Well, imagine this scenario, if you will. You are hiking in the Amazon forest, rainforest. And you come across a society that doesn't at all speak your English, or doesn't at all speak English, or whatever language that you speak. The task of interpretation, or specifically radical interpretation, is the way in which I can come to understand the meaning of the words that this foreign alien society is using. So, for Davidson... The question of what meaning is starts with this project of radical interpretation. And that seems to make sense, right? There's a lot of emphasis for Davidson on this empirical question of how meaning is actually gained in the first place. So rather than taking meaning and trying to analyze it and look at the way that we currently use it in our English language, why not look at meaning as how it actually evolves in the first place? So in Word and Object, Quine specifically talks about the way that young children learn language. And this is the same type of approach. So for Davidson, he is concerned with providing a theory of meaning that will solve the problem of radical interpretation. And by solve the problem of radical interpretation, that means to provide a clear account that works empirically of the way in which people interpret a language that they have never, ever um, interpreted before and have no understanding of. So Davidson is going to take this primitive conception of truth and apply it to this, this project of radical interpretation. And this is how the project of meaning unfolds, is through this ongoing process of radical interpretation. So the first thing to understand here about radical interpretation is that Davidson applies the interpretation of any sentence in a language, and let's specifically talk about like a foreign language, so we're not caught up with any of our uh, English quiddities. Um, a sentence, the, inter the way in which we interpret a foreign sentence to us depends upon the, the truth conditions of what that sentence is. So the way in which I will understand the meaning of this foreign society's language 
is through knowing what will make that sentence true or false. Okay? That is all that is required. And that is why for Davidson, meaning is something that is ultimately defined in terms of truth. Because the meaning of any sentence is defined purely in terms of what makes that sentence true and what makes that sentence false. Does that make sense for everyone? Is everyone understanding the relationship between meaning, radical interpretation, and truth? Because those are the three components that lie at the foundation of his philosophical uh, project. You think so? No. Well. I could try to explain again if enough people don't feel like they were able to uh, to understand what's going on here. I was half listening. Would it help if I draw a picture? I'll draw a picture for everyone. Okay. I will draw a picture. We're going back to paint. So, the truth. Meaning. Okay. Davidson believes that truth itself. Oops, that's the wrong way around. Truth leads to meaning. How does truth lead to meaning? Well, we look at the process of radical interpretation. And what is radical interpretation? The way we understand the way we understand a language we've never heard before. This is a project. So a theory of meaning is correct. A theory of meaning is correct if and only if it is able to give an empirical account of the way that radical interpretation works. A theory of meaning, a theory of meaning is correct if and only if it is able to account for the way that we understand a language that we've never heard before. And Davidson thinks that the way in which we interpret sentences depends on the truth conditions of those sentences. So what is the meaning of a sentence? or actually better, how do we interpret a foreign sentence? How do we do it? Look at its truth conditions. Okay. So interpretation is tied to meaning because any theory of meaning uh, basically needs to, how do you account for radical interpretation? Based on the success of, based on the success under which we can communicate with someone from a radically different language group. So if a sentence is not true, we cannot meaningfully interpret it. No, no, no. Okay, let's talk about truth conditions. What is a truth condition? Truth conditions. The things that make a sentence true. So if I say, for example, Wow, the sky's really, or the sun's really bright today. What are going to make that true? What's going to be true is if, you know, I look up at the sky and, ooh, it really hurts my eyes. There's an instance where that sentence becomes true. But truth conditions aren't, aren't just knowing when it's going to be true, but also by virtue of knowing when it's going to be true, when it's going to be false. So if you negate, uh, I won't use complex terminology. Uh, essentially, if you know when, a th when something is going to be true, you are going to know when it's going to be false. If you know that in all instances a sentence is going to be false, you are still providing the truth conditions for that sentence, Stanislav. So, yes, even if a sentence is always false, as long as we know when it is always false, then we can interpret the sentence. Hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense? 
What about sentences that are metaphoric? Well, we'll get into that. Don't worry, we will get into that. But we have to start very bare, right? We're starting very bare. We're starting with radical interpretation. So the instance that we're going to look at a lot today is the following example. And this is the example given by Quine in, in Word and Object. And this leads to the problem of the indeterminacy of translation. Very uh, pretentious uh, name, but it's also pretty interesting, okay? Actually, to get, to get everyone's mouths a little bit wet, okay? To get people a little taste of how interesting this topic is, I want you to consider this scenario, okay? Everyone, let's get some... What's that royalty-free website? Can we get some... Um, Let's get some, uh, 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 royalty free. I want some Amazonian, traditional Amazonian, uh, music. Anyone, uh, know some royalty free Amazon rainforest music? <laughs> to really set the, to set the atmosphere. Come on. We, we wanna, we wanna set the atmosphere for this. Um, I just, I can't tell if it's, uh, world's free. Here's one. No, these are all, these all cost money. Toto Africa. I did type it into YouTube. I have this in my head. Is this royalty free? This isn't royalty free. Royalty free. Jungle music. Here we go. No, it's a little too spooky. No, a little too epic. No, this is too, this is too, uh... Now that's what I'm talking about. This is exactly what I was talking about. Oh wait, this doesn't look... Fuck, this is not... That, that's exactly what I want, but it's not royalty free. Fuck's sakes. Oh, but that's exactly, exactly what I'm going for. Um, come on, baby, we'll find it. Oh, here we go. Nope. I'm going to find this. I don't care if we're here all day. I'm going to find royalty-free jungle music. Too late, I already muted the VOD. No way. No way. Okay, here we go. This is what this is what I'm talking about. Okay, here we go. Everyone, we've now set the scene. I'm gonna turn the music down just a little bit, okay? Here we go. Imagine you are in the rainforest and you come across this, I hope they don't sing. Um, and you come across a man. Preview. It's yelling preview. <laughs> preview. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. That adds. That's like the the chance of this foreign, this foreign society. They yell preview all the time. Okay. Preview. So we come across a man, okay? Preview. Okay? And he's got, he's just, he's just, he's in the jungle. And it's, uh, look, these are the, this is the rainforest, you see? And you find this man, okay? And he's in a clearing. And all of a sudden, that whoosh whoosh right across the clearing Preview. right across the clearing a a what appears to be a rabbit a rabbit jumps across 
and the man points at the rabbit, and he yells. Uh. Uh, he yells. What's the opposite of... Yeah, he yells preview. preview. That's right. He yells preview. Perfect. Well, we know that when he says preview, he certainly doesn't mean preview in the sense that we mean preview, of course, obviously. So the question is, well, what does this man mean by preview when he yells preview? That was anticlimactic. Okay, here we go. It's back now. When he yells preview, what does he mean? Well, let's look at this. A rabbit runs past the clearing. He points at the rabbit. Preview. And he yells preview. Well, what is going to be the natural candidate for what that means? Preview. Well... First of all, it could be the rabbit, right? It could be the rabbit. That makes sense, right? That that seems very, very, like that, that seems very intuitive, doesn't it? But it could also be the act of an animal running. But it could also be the rustling of the leaves as the rabbit runs past. So what are, what are we seeing here? What are we what are we finding out in this case? Preview. Well, it seems like it's ambiguous. It's it's indeterminate what exactly we are to interpret preview as in this case. So what what are we going to do? What are we going to do to determine what preview means in this foreign language? Yeah, it could also be, look at that son of a bitch go. You're exactly right. You are exactly right. So what are we going to do? Come on, what would you do? You are you are in this forest with this man yelling preview at a rabbit. And you want to know what preview means. Put yourself in their shoes. What are you going to do? Stanislav says, experiment with other rabbits. Well, that's very interesting. Okay, so, so, it just so happens that for some reason, when you came into the jungle, you brought with you a massive box of rabbits, okay? And so you decide you're gonna go up to this guy and you're gonna release a bunch of rabbits in front of him, okay? And what are you gonna see? You're gonna see, does he yell preview that time? You're gonna point, you're gonna, you can try now pointing at the rabbit and say, preview? And he could go, uh-huh, he could, he could, give his affirmation towards it. Or it could be going, uh-uh, mm-mm, right? So if the man descends to you yelling preview at the rabbit, well, you know now that preview wasn't referring to the rabbit. It was referring to perhaps something else. It could have been referring to the rustling of the leaves that were present, but are no longer present. Well, if you are now, okay, maybe it's the rustling of the leaves. Maybe you now grab a branch off of a tree uh, and you shake the tree, you shake the leaves and you yell, preview? And he might go, aha! Okay, well now you know that preview has something to do with the act of you shaking the leaves. But there's an issue here. So we can run this test as many times as we want. As, as many possible times as we want. But Quine's point and Quine's argument in word and object is that we will never, ever be able to actually have a correct radical interpretation of a foreign language because with a rabbit we can never know if the word preview refers to the rabbit itself or to a spatio-temporal part of the rabbit we don't know if it is referring to this specific part of the rabbit or maybe it's this specific part of the rabbit Right? And we can do is we can now like chop off the head of the rabbit, for example, and bring its corpse and yell, preview? But as far as we want to get into the rabbit, 
no matter what we do, there is always a part of the rabbit that we may not necessarily, uh, that might not necessarily be what is preview. You see? So, we'll never know with absolute certainty, you know, whether or not we are able to fully understand the translation of, or the interpretation of some word in the language. But we have to determine the success of it based on our, I would say, instrumental success. That would be my, that would be my, uh, my inclination at least. So, but what are, we, what are we realizing here? What 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 is underlying this project in in this forest with this man? Well, it's exactly what I was saying over here. It has to do with the truth conditions. It has to do with the conditions under which it is true that preview is there. And it doesn't make sense to ascribe a truth value to um to a single word, right? But you can easily see how this readily translates because all of a sudden, if I start to learn an adjective like green, right? And I yell preview, because saying preview would basically just be sort, be short for, well, there is preview here, or, or uh, preview is running past, right? Um, so yeah, we, we have that, we have this understanding now of why the truth conditions are paramount to having a successful theory of radical interpretation and this is the basis and i'll turn off this music now i hope i hope this uh maybe this is this now makes a bit more sense now that we've uh i've really allowed you to get in touch with the thought experiment maybe this is now making more uh more sense hopefully um that the task of radical interpretation underlies the theory of meaning. A successful theory of meaning is going to be one that allows for successful radical interpretation. And we can now see how the task of radical interpretation, that project, requires understanding the truth conditions of the sentence. So this is all fine and all, but this is very vague. This is all very, uh, without the music, I wouldn't have gotten it. Well, I'm glad then. Um, we still have this issue of we are talking in very vague terms here. We need to have a more rigorous definition of truth. In order to understand the truth conditions of something, we have to understand, well, what truth is in the first place. And so, like I was saying, while it is true that, uh, while it is absolutely true that Davidson doesn't give a rigorous definition of truth, he still believes that for any language, we can develop a count of what uh, truth can be understood as. Uh, because essentially, a theory of meaning must be able to, to account for all of the possible truth conditions for a sentence. But the only way we can understand the truth conditions of a sentence is to understand what the definition of a truth predicate would be. And what do we mean by truth predicate? Well, let me give give you an example. The sentence, the preview is fluffy, is true if and only if P. Okay? Where P is some something to be filled in. We want to fill in what P is. Uh, we want to have an account of truth that allows us for any sentence, for any sentence in our language we can apply the truth predicate by just saying that it is true and determine the conditions under which that is the case. Does that make sense? So to understand truth conditions, we have to understand that for any sentence, there needs to be something else that is occurring in order to make it true. But this isn't giving a definition of truth necessarily because we still recognize that at the very root of it, truth is something that is primitive but we can still look at the way that truth functions within our language. And with that, we can develop an account of meaning. Now, this is where this is going to be the trickiest part of the stream is explaining exactly what we mean by the truth predicates. So I'm going to do my best here to explain this. Essentially, we want to figure out what kind of predicate 
truth is in our language. And of course, for Davidson, truth is truth because he's a sentential primitivist, he's a deflationist about truth. Now, if we recognize that, we also need to recognize something else about our language that really complicates matters. And this is why he likes Tarski so much. In our language, we can develop sentences of an infinitely long syntactic length. And that is to say, we can devise sentences theoretically that are infinitely long by just adding conjunctions, which are to say we just add and clauses to the end of all of our sentence. So the sky is blue and my cup is copper and my microphone is on and I'm streaming right now and it's 30 degrees Celsius and the weather is not looking great today and because the, there are clouds in the sky and trees are green. I can devise an infinitely long sentence and in order for our theory of truth to be correct, which underlies our theory of meaning, we have to be able to give an account of truth that can provide the truth conditions for these infinitely long sentences. And that's a really complicated process. But that is why he likes Alfred Tarski so much. Why does he like Alfred Tarski? Because he provides a recursive definition of truth. And I'm sure those, you know, you, you computer science nerds in the chat probably have an idea of what recursion is. I tried the other day on stream to give an intuitive definition of what recursion is. But I'm and I'm not going to try to do it again. <laughs> but in essence, a recursive definition allows you to self-reference something in the definition to allow you to define things of an infinite length. That is the basis of it. And the reason why um, the reason why Tarski was so important is because his semantic conception of truth allows for recursive definition. It, I mean, it doesn't just allow for it, it is a recursive definition. And I'm not going to uh, describe to you here exactly what Davidson's theory of truth is, um, and specifically what is called the schema T, or the T schema, because uh, that is what functions as the truth predicate for Davidson. But what you ultimately need to know is that truth itself uh, cannot be defined. It doesn't have a definition. It's not subject to analysis. It is simply a primitive notion. Number two, a theory of meaning has to be couched in the ability to interpret any possible sentence in a language, which then would entail giving a recursive definition of the truth predicate. So not, not truth, but the way that the predicate functions in our language. Um, and ultimately, this truth predicate is going to be understood as Tarski's T schema. I'm not going to explain what the T schema is. If you're interested in that, I might be able to do a separate stream on that, but it's an extremely complicated topic, and Tarski's paper on the subject is really, really complicated. Um, okay, so there are many issues with this, this account. The first is, the first has to do with an object language and a meta language. Okay, Let, let's let's talk about let's talk about object languages and meta languages. Um, is anyone familiar with this concept? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Um, it's pretty dope, though. Uh, a meta language. Uh, and let's bring up some let's bring up some music again, because uh, we are we're gonna go we're going back to the jungle, everybody. Uh, I want everyone to to get excited because we're going back to the jungle. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Preview. Oh yeah. And preview is back, baby. That's right. We're going back into the jungle. <laughs> preview. 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 Okay. We're back in the jungle. Preview. And we're just chilling with our boy here. And he's like hanging out with his rabbits or whatever. Okay. So we find our guy, he's just chilling with the uh with the with the rabbits in the jungle, okay? And for some reason our friend comes along. Our friend, our our scholar our scholarly friend, Sarah. Okay. 
Now Sarah and I, we start talking about preview. What is preview? We want to figure out, well, what does preview mean? Okay. So what I want to explain now is the difference between an object language. Oops, I just spilled a bit of water. Not much, though, that's fine. The difference between an object language and a meta language. This isn't actually that complicated to understand, so don't worry. I'm just making this entertaining by uh, talking about, by discussing uh, our little jungle adventure. So the object language, very roughly put, is the language being spoken. Uh, or uh, what is uh, mm, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to do this okay well let's say that I go up with Sarah to this band and I yell preview 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 okay we are talking uh oh uh oh I did get a little water on my keyboard and all of a sudden it started spamming a period key. So let's, uh, we're just gonna put this upside down just a little bit, okay? It's fine. It was just a little water. It should be okay. I just, I can't type anymore. That's totally fine, it's totally fine. No, no, don't worry, everyone. Calm down, it's totally fine. I, I have, remember, did, I broke my keyboard on stream. Do you remember that? I broke my keyboard on stream. Uh, last year. Does everyone remember this? Was anyone, is anyone OG? Oh no. I can't click either. It's uh... Oh no, but that's because a key is literally being pressed down on my keyboard right now. Preview. That's fine. It's fine! Everyone, calm down. Oh. It's okay. We're good. Preview. Unplug? Okay, fine, I'll unplug. Sure. If I've unplugged the keyboard, but again, it should be fine because it was just a little, uh, a little bit of water. Okay, so the object language is the language that is being spoken about. So when I'm talking to Sarah about this mysterious language that we have discovered where we're talking about rabbits and stuff, uh, I am talking about the language. Uh, and let's call this language, um, let's see what's on this random sticky note here. Yellow six, okay? This is the yellow six language. So the, the yellow six language is the language that this person is speaking when they're saying preview, preview, preview when pointing at a rabbit. Preview. But then the language that Sarah and I are using to talk about the yellow six language is called the meta language. So does that make sense? I mean, an easy example is like, when I say, oh, French is such a confusing language. It has gendered nouns, yada, yada. The object language in this case is is French, but the meta language that I'm using to talk about that language is English. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that make sense? Preview. Yes, no, maybe, perhaps, a little bit, a tiny bit, half. Yes, perfect. Good. I'm glad. It, I'm glad it's making sense. Preview. Does it reverse if we're talking in French but talking about English? Absolutely. If I am speaking French with someone and we're talking about how English is, you know, is confusing because if it's all, because uh, it doesn't use gendered nouns, then all of a sudden our meta language would be French and our object language would be English. Okay? So the first thing that we face an issue with when we are trying to define the truth predicate in our language by examining the role that it plays in our languages, um, is that we seem to be doing this completely circularly. For example, how exactly am I able to talk about the truth predicate without being circular? Because it seems like to talk about the truth predicate, I have to be using a language that utilizes the truth predicate. So it seems to be viciously circular, right? So let, let us just suppose an example here. Let us suppose that, that I am completely fluent in English, 
but I don't know any French, okay? The goal essentially is for me to understand the meaning of all of the sentences spoken by the French individuals around me. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll turn up this, uh, this, this music now. I, I, it could be getting on some people's nerves. The goal is for me to understand the language of everybody uh, around me who is speaking French. So if we are using Davidson's analysis of meaning, this is essentially paramount to treating English here as the meta language, because I only speak English, I don't speak French, and now treating French as the object language. And so for every possible sentence in French, I have to provide a sentence in English that is coextensive with the Eng with the French sentences. And what does coextensive means? It means that for every English or for every French sentence that I can devise, uh, there should be an equivalent English sentence that has the exact same truth conditions. That is how we know that successful uh, interpretation has occurred, is when I can provide for any sentence of this foreign language, of the object language, I can provide an equivalent sentence in my meta language with this English. So I've successfully interpreted or translated the French language in, in its full form, when for any sentence you give me in French, I can provide you with an English sentence where the truth conditions of the two sentences are completely equivalent. Does that make sense? This makes sense to people? Yes? Okay, perfect. And this seems very plausible to people because we seem to be able to know the meaning of the truth conditions of our English language and simply place them upon the French one. But the issue is, well, we're applying this to the French sentence, right? Or to the French language. But how do we know the meanings of the sentences in the English language? And it seems that we then start to get an infinite regress because to ensure that I have a good understanding of the English language, I need to have somehow devised another meta language by which to examine the object language of English. And this seems to presuppose that I know the meaning of the words in English in the same way that I know the meaning of the words in, Fran in French. So... This creates a this creates a a sort of paradoxical relationship by which I interpret a language only by being able to interpret another language. And this creates the regress because in order to interpret the meta language I'm using to talk about the object language in, I need to have a meta meta language. And then I need a meta 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 language, and so on and so forth, right? Now the and this is why for for Davidson, the process of radical translation is so important, because in the process of radical translation, I am gaining empirical evidence to understand the meaning of different units of the language in a way that is completely non-semantical. That is to say, I am learning the meaning of words in a way that doesn't utilize the notion of reference or meaning in the first place. I do this solely through what Quine would call a stimulus condition uh, of a sensory state, okay? Now, let's, let's put that aside for one second, but let's try to tie this all back together. The fundamental issue with interpreting a new language is that when I do so, I presuppose that I have successfully interpreted the language I already have. So in order to devise a correct theory of meaning, I need to do so in a way that doesn't use a meta language that, that basically presupposes my conception of meaning in the first place. So the way that we can understand meaning is by looking at the project of radical translation in a way that doesn't invoke a type of meta language. We are just examining one language and we are examining our sensory states in relation to, or other people's sensory states as well, in relation to the language that they are then using. And for Quine, 
this is, you know, the form of stimulus conditions as sensory states because Quine was a behaviorist. Uh, but this is ultimately something that Davidson doesn't believe is possible. So in the case of the individual in the rainforest who is pointing at the rabbit and yelling, preview, 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 Quine believes that the evidence we're getting for the meaning of the word preview comes in the form of stimulus conditions. Now, this is contentious because this is a behavioral analysis of language in that for, for Quine, we can know that someone means something by analyzing their behavior depending on the type of stimulus that are surrounding them. So the fact that I keep pointing to a rabbit and yelling, preview, 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 that is enough for Quine to say that we are able to essentially get into the mind, the mind in quotes, and take that as evidence for the meaning of a word. Does that make sense? It's the behavior of the person itself, and only the behavior of the person, that allows one to understand the meaning of the words that they use. But Davidson rejects this. Davidson doesn't believe in the behaviorist account of, of the mind because he believes that this is essentially reducing the concept of meaning to something that is purely scientific. And this is where Davidson's theory of mind and theory of action comes into play because Davidson doesn't believe in a reduction of psychical states to uh, physical states. He is not a brain, uh, a mind, brain, or psychoneural identity, uh, identity theorist. And this perhaps makes sense to you if you've watched the last few streams where we've talked about that reductionist, reductionist program of reducing all mind states or all types of mind states to a type of brain state. So Quine would say that in essence, we can reduce every type of mental state, like my believing that there is a preview in front of me, simply to the scientific behavior that one exhibits. And that's it. That's where it ends. But Davidson rejects that because he doesn't believe it is legitimate to reduce, to reduce those mind states to a type of scientific analysis in the form of behavior or what Quine is calling a stimulus condition as sensory states. Does this make sense? I know it's complicated, but uh, ho I'm hoping that makes a little bit of sense. <clears throat> this is where Davidson and Quine begin to part ways with one another. Because the evidence for the meaning of a word for Quine takes the form of scientific sensory states that can be empirically examined. But for Davidson, it, that's not possible. He rejects the idea of scientific reductionism. And he says that instead, we have to have actually direct access, or maybe indirect access to the mental states themselves. Okay, Does this makes sense. Anyone? <laughs> Give me affirmation or if I need to explain a bit better or start over again, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it does make sense. Aussie man DS, okay. Yes, yes. So, Bapra, I'll, I'll answer that stuff at the end. <clears throat> yes, but it seems like a scientific disagreement of what we can or cannot measure. No, it's not about that. And I'll explain. So, I'll explain why. Uh, I'll explain now why Davidson believes that this project of reduction uh, is illegitimate. So, so at the core of Davidson's theory of action, which is a theory about the way that people act and the relationship between the mind and the physical actions that someone takes, um, is a refusal to essentially reduce uh, mind states to something physical. And he rejects this identity theory of the mind and also rejects the idea of psychophysical laws. And psychophysical laws are laws that essentially want to link certain psychical states to states that are physical. So this is something that the main, the mind brain identity theorists would absolutely agree with. They would say that, or would agree that it's possible to posit the, the laws rather, uh, because they would say that, for example, any pain state that I have, any mental pain state that I have can be lawfully connected 
to a certain type of brain state. But on a priori grounds, that is before even any sort of empirical investigation or scientific investigation like Tunnelman is suggesting, there's an a priori reason why the two domains of the physical and the mental cannot be reduced down to one another or be made equivalent. And the reasoning behind this lies upon what is called Davidson's principle of charity, which I have talked about before uh, when I talked about the brain in a bat, brain in a bat hypothesis, Chalmers functionalist solution to the radical skeptical scenarios, uh, and my own my own solution to the brain in a bat hypothesis is by invoking Davidson's principle of charity. At the root of this is the belief that all persons are rational in some fundamental sense. And it is only from this that one can apply any sort of conditions to the psychical realm. Because Davidson recognizes that there is something that governs the law of thought that simply cannot be applied to the realm of the physical. To the mind of a person, we can impose these normative standards like coherence, and rationality and consistency that we simply can't apply to the physical realm. I cannot tell the physical realm you need to be more consistent, you need to be more coherent, more rational. That doesn't even make sense in the first place. But to a person, there are rational standards that are necessarily imposed upon the web of beliefs that someone holds in their mind that are not at all found in nature. And so if it is true that we can reduce all mental states to something physical, then it would also mean that we can apply these rational conditions to physical states, but we simply can't. We can't say that these brain states are not consistent with one another. That doesn't make any sort of sense. That invokes an already existing notion of the mental like truth conditions, because consistency is defined by what is true, uh, what is possible to be true at the same time. And same with coherence and rationality. These are mental normative standards that can't be imposed upon the physical realm. It doesn't make sense for me to go up to a piece of nature now, be more rational. It just doesn't make sense. And so it is from this a priori ground, this, this realm before investigation, that Davidson rejects the reduction of the mental to the physical. And that's why, for Davidson, he rejects Quine's idea that we can have evidence for the meaning of words based on sensory states that someone is in. Instead, Davidson thinks we get, we, we understand the meaning of words based upon the beliefs that someone in that language has. And beliefs are mental events. They are not something that is physical. They are not physical brain states like they are for Quine. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's do a quick recap here. Davidson thinks that a theory of meaning is going to be successful if and only if it is able to successfully solve the project of radical interpretation. That is to say, it is only successful if the theory of meaning can provide an account, an empirical account, of the way in which we come to know a language that we have zero familiarity with, okay? At the root of a theory of meaning, he believes that truth conditions are the guide. We will understand the meaning of words and sentences based on the situations in which they are true, okay? And also, we have to acknowledge that for any language, we can construct infinitely theoretically, infinitely long sentences. And so our definition of truth has to be recursive. And because of this, Davidson evokes Tarski's T schema, which I'm not going to define, but if you're interested in that, you can look at that, okay? Now the question is, how do we gain access to knowing the truth conditions of the sentences and words that underlie the theory of meaning for this project of radical interpretation. Quine says, well, we look at the sensory states of the people, of the people we are trying to radically interpret. But David says, says no, we can't reduce these mental states to something physical because there's, there's something a priori 
true about the mental that is not true about the physical. Namely, there are certain conditions, rational conditions that we impose upon the mental realm that we can impose upon the physical realm, namely standards of coherence, rationality, consistency, etc. So instead, Davidson is going to say, we gain access about evidence of the truth conditions of words and sentences based on knowing the beliefs of other people. So this is the final step in the chain, is how do we gain access to the beliefs of someone else? How do we gain access to the beliefs of, uh, of someone whose language we don't at all understand? We want to figure out the general process by which we can begin to interpret an alien language. We know so far that this method consists essentially in assigning truth conditions to various sentences within an alien language. But this process is very conceptually demanding because how are we supposed to know? How could we ever really know the aliens, the alien agent's truth conditions for a certain sentence uh, in their language um, by gaining access to the beliefs for evidence? Uh, I'm confused. So how does meaning come in? Is it automatic with rationality? If you're rational, you can define meaning. I mean, meaning is something that we have to recognize that we have in the first place, right? It's it's one of those primitive concepts that we're trying to analyze to get a better understanding of. But meaning is something we're capable of having be, just simply because of the fact that we're able to understand each other. So clearly meaning is something that exists. Clearly it is something that we're able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the question is, well, how exactly do we cash out meaning in a way that makes sense with the rest of our philosophical conceptions? And for Davidson, that means by understanding meaning in terms of the truth conditions of sentences. And the best way to understand how this process works is by examining the project of radical interpretation. So Davidson rejects uh, Quine's behaviorist theory on the grounds that there is some a priori difference between things capable of certain rational thoughts and those are and those that are not. Yeah, that's exactly right. Is that we can impose standards upon people and people's mental states that we can't impose upon, for example, rocks. I can't tell a rock to be more rational. I can't tell a rock be you need to have coherent beliefs. Your beliefs should be coherent. I can't say anything like that to physical states. Those two things are just not compatible with one another, but we're able to impose these normative concepts where we're telling people that you ought to obey in a certain way uh, to their mental states, not to their physical states. And that's why Davidson rejects this notion of the reduction of the mental to the physical. Uh, hopefully that makes, uh, can we tell a tiger to be more rational? Um, that's a good question. I'm sure you could say something along those lines like, if you want to continue to get X, you need to behave in this certain type of way. Um, and in that sense, I think that tigers are capable of a certain level of rationality. And we can, we can tell a tiger that in certain ways by restricting what kind of food we give them, etc. And then they'll learn from that, right? So in that sense, perhaps, but uh, I don't know enough about um, the the nature of animals to really give an answer to that, to be honest. Thank you very much, Godson, and thank you so much for the follow. Um, okay, so where were we here? Uh, right, we were talking about gaining access to, uh, gaining access to the mental states of other people's thoughts without literally going into their brain. So the question is, how can we figure out when a person, because ultimately this, this is what it's going to boil down to for Davidson, is we need to know the mental states of someone when they say a sentence and figure out whether they are affirming the sentence or disaffirming the sentence. And so they are going to be beliefs about whether a sentence is true or false. And so that is ultimately what the job of the radical interpreter is going to be, is examining someone and seeing whether they are assenting to a sentence and therefore ascribing it a certain condition of truth under that particular instance or dissenting from it. 
And from this, we can inductively infer the truth conditions of that sentence as a whole. And then from that, we can understand by the principle of compositionality, which we talked about yesterday in the theory of meaning stream uh, with Frege, we can then ascribe certain meaning to individual words. So hopefully that makes some sort of sense. Now I can't, I won't, I won't go into too much detail about this, but the reality is that fundamentally at the root of this, there is a, there is a type of intentionality that exists between an individual and the behavior that they exhibit. And so for any sentence, there will, co there will correspond some certain type of belief, some certain belief state that caused having that belief or such that having that belief is what caused the utterer to say that sentence, right? So for any sentence that I say, there was some underlying belief state that caused me to say the sentence, right? And so for Davidson, when I utter a sentence, there corresponds a belief of holding it true, of holding it true that this sentence occurs that is causing me to utter that sentence. So the way that I can start to understand the truth conditions of an individual is by recognizing that when someone says a sentence, they are for almost they are almost always going to be saying true things. And this is where that principle of charity comes into play because Davidson believes that the majority of the beliefs that someone says are true because successful communication wouldn't be possible otherwise. Because if we were saying, for the most part, false things, representing false beliefs, then language wouldn't be possible in the first place. And then, and if you are curious as to why that is, I have a video up. Um, when did I talk about... The web of belief. I think there's a video up on my channel where I talk about that web of belief, but we're just going to take that for granted uh, right now. So the question is, how can we know necessarily when I am affirming the truth of a sentence that I hold? Well, Brain of Avasana, okay, I will, I will get that uploaded. This is now where Davidson introduces the idea of a belief that the utterance is true or can be is true is true this is where davidson introduces the idea of decision theory and because of the nature of decision theory i really can't give you a whole lot of detail on this i could do a whole decision theory stream one day but it's of such a different nature that i think it'll be really in inaccessible to some people um but essentially a, a type of decision theory will allow a, a, a sort of guide towards a solution of how we're supposed to analyze the interpretive process. The first thing we have to do is we have to, we have to provide an analysis of beliefs that take the form of holding a certain sentence to be true. And this will give rise to three concepts that are going to be publicly observable. Because Davidson, like almost everyone else, recognizes that that beliefs are a private type of behavior. So Davidson wants a way to analyze this private, not behavior, rather, uh, concept, wants a way to analyze these private belief states into a way that allows us to publicly come to know them. And Davidson thinks that we can do this by reducing the idea of belief down to a degree of belief the relative strength of a uh, relative strength of a preference and a sort of method of interpretation, and this is where it gets confusing. But I'm going to basically summarize for you, summarize for you the three step process utilizing a decision theory that Davidson thinks we use to interpret this alien language. Okay, so first of all, a rational agent is going to start interacting with individuals long enough to start to interpret the functional connectives of the language. And that is going to be called the propositional logical structure. Now, what the fuck does that mean? Because it sounds super complicated. It's really not. It's coming to understand, uh, comes to understand like propositions, 
or prepositions like and or not, uh, etc. And the way that I can start to understand that is by in the in the way of the rabbit example, right? If I uh, if I show if if I see this individual point to the rabbit and say preview, I start to think, well, this rabbit might be, you know, this rabbit could potentially be um, what is meant by preview. But then if I go to the person and I show them the rabbit and I say preview, they'll say nah preview, and all of a sudden I can start to understand the the, the way that certain connectives function in the language. Well, then I will bring them something else that isn't, or, or I'll bring them another rabbit, and I'll say, uh, preview? And they'll say, nah, nah, preview, right? And all of a sudden, I can start to learn the way that a not, how not functions in their language, and how and functions in their language, and how or functions in their language. So that is the first step. It's understanding the logical structure of the sentence. Unfortunately, too busy with work to listen, but thank you for your time on lecturing. Hey, thank you so much, Rico TV. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the $10, man. And uh, I, if you're too busy to work, don't worry. This will be uploaded on YouTube, so you'll definitely be able to listen soon. Thank you so much for supporting me, man. Um, right, so we understand the logical structure of the language. And then comes the really key. This is where everything comes together. The next step is... Knowing the logical structure of the language, just simply the way that the words and, but, not, or all play in the language, we can now, using a decision theoretic process, determine the probabilities and the utilities of the various sentences of the language as we observe occasions of assent or dissent towards utterances. So the the so me being an interpreter. Utilizing the principle of charity, I impose upon these individuals who speak a completely different language beliefs of the type preferring a certain sentence to be true over another sentence being true. And the way that I do that is I examine them over a long period of time, saying a bunch of different sentences under different conditions. And if they say, uh, preview, na, blah, 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 blah right, in a certain scenario, and they don't say it in another, I can ascribe to that a certain probability that it is under these specific scenarios that one would assent to the truth of that sentence over another. And so we can recognize that when someone is saying a sentence a lot in a given circumstance, that increases the probability, increases the probability that that is what is that is being assented to in that circumstance. And from that, we start to understand the truth conditions underlying that language. And so once we've assigned these probabilities of the likelihood that a certain, uh, a certain sentence is assenting to a given uh, empirical situation, so the likelihood that me saying uh, preview is just saying this is a rabbit, if I see that a thousand times, the probability that that is an ascension to there being a rabbit there increases more and more and more and more and more, right? So as soon as I've begun to assign these subjective probabilities to the sentences in the language, I'm allowed to develop a gradual process by which I can understand the meanings of the syntactical units of this language. As I say, as I begin to understand the the truth conditions and the probability that a certain sentence is expressing the truth of a given situation, I can, from these sentences, infer the meaning of each of their component parts. And this would obviously happen over a very, very, very long period of time. But you can really see how this process is going to occur. And it is through understanding this process of radical interpretation that a theory of meaning is going to be correct. The theory of meaning is going to be correct if and only if it allows us to actually understand these foreign languages that people are using. And Davidson thinks that the correct theory of meaning is going to be one that essentially boils down to one where we interpret the beliefs uh, of this foreign, um, foreign individual that a given sentence that they are saying is more likely to be true than any other sentence that they could say that they could say in a given circumstance. And notice that the only semantic 
conception being invoked in the theory of meaning then is this notion of truth. All, all that is present there is, is just preference for one sentence to be true over another. And obviously from their perspective, it is obviously true, right? But for us, someone who doesn't fully grasp the language, we can't always be certain under which conditions the sentence they're uttering is going to be true or not. And that is why Davidson invokes this notion of, of decision theory, because it means that we are able to understand these languages over a long, gradual process as the probabilities of the truth of a sentence, meaning what it does, increases or decreases in other, in other scenarios, right? So if I observe someone saying, um, preview, 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 right? The probability that that means uh, rabbit increases the more I see it happening in circumstances where there's a rabbit around. But as soon as they say preview and there's no rabbit around, well, zoom, my probability shoots down. And all of a sudden, the probability that they have a preference for the truth of that sentence in a circumstance where there is a rabbit goes down because that indicates that there is something other than a rabbit that preview seems to be referring to. And it is through that gradual process observing this type of behavior and not a scientific analysis like Quine wants to say, but gaining access to the beliefs of these foreign individuals that we ultimately come to know the meaning of the words of a foreign language through the project of radical interpretation. And that's, that is Davidson's theory of meaning. It's extremely complicated and I skimmed over a ton of stuff but I wanted to at least try to sketch out the general project as a whole. And now you could easily go and look at any of his, any of it, because all of his works all tie into one another. So any essay that, you know, grab from Davidson, you will be able to see how it fits in with this general project of radical interpretation, because that's ultimately all that Davidson's project is about. Um, if you're confused about specific things like truth, like what, what exactly is meant by truth? What exactly is the process of, of radical interpretation? What do I mean by the syntactic propositional structure? What do you mean by this principle of charity? These very specific notions are obviously very complicated. And so he writes entire essays on these specific notions. But I just wanted to give you sort of a general gist of the entire project, because as soon as I was able to understand the holistic nature of his philosophy, everything just started uh, fitting uh, in with one another. Um, where should people start? Uh, you should start with his essays on truth and interpretation, which I think are... Yeah, right here. Inquiries into truth and interpretation. Then also his... So these are the two, these are the books. These are the books that you would read um, for Davidson. Uh, Inquiries into Truth and Interpretation and Essays on Actions uh, and Events. And I would start with uh, Truth and Interpretation and just read all of them. I mean, they are, it's a slow development of the, uh, of his entire, of his entire project. And it's, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. He's a great writer. And I genuinely believe that if, if you've listened to this, this lecture, and even though if you didn't understand everything in it, as long as you had a rough understanding of the goal of the project, the way that the different parts of his philosophy relate in solving the project or uh, fulfilling the project, then I think you'll have a good idea of what he's talking about in each of the essays. Because otherwise, if you just go into it blind without any idea of what he's trying to do in the, uh, at the end of the day, then you're going to be really lost uh, in any of the essays, I think. So, yeah, hopefully that this lecture has, uh, has, made, uh, has made sense. Unrelated question, what desktop chair are you using? I have no idea. I have zero idea. Ask Z. Z's knows. Has he maintained the view more or less his whole career? Yeah, basically. He never really changed his uh, mind on stuff. I have no idea what my chair is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, 
Oh, Herman Miller. That sounds right. That does sound right. Herman Miller sounds right. I, did, I got it from a, an office. So, like a, an office went out of business. So, I grabbed it. That's that's essentially what happened. Um, Herman Miller is an expensive chair. I can't remember. I've had this I don't know how long now. Is this view agnostic to the innateness of certain aspects of language? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not really concerned with that. Um, yeah. No, it would be agnostic to that. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about uh, ableism on stream. Uh, see, I don't know if this... Uh, I don't know if this is going to go counter to my whole educational thing if I if I choose to talk about this, you know. Uh oh, my keyboard is mucking up again. That's not good. That's weird. Whenever I type a W. If I hold down W, I get period. And if I hold down S, it types a period. Oh. Oh, now if I type period, I get nothing. So now my period key doesn't work. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh. That's fine. I can live without a period key because I can just rebind it. <laughs> That's okay. I'll live, I'll live, I'll live, I'll live. This is a cheap uh, keyboard anyways. I got it specifically because... Uh, you changed the language on Windows, probably. No, I didn't. No. No. It's, it's literally just the period key does not work. That's okay. So do I, do I want to talk about ableism on Twitch? And talk about Destiny stuff? Oh, wait. No, the period key is back. Now, oh, now it's spamming the period key. Uh-oh. This is not good. Hold on. There's a... I had a uh, little... Oh, what is the way you uh, pull out? You can do it with this, right? Uh, I might have to get a new keyboard. Oh, that sucks. Hey, want to help find a new keyboard? Donate now. <laughs> I had a little uh, thing, a key pull, a key cap puller, but it's okay. One thousand dollar chair, five dollar keyboard. Uh, is that sell the chair? It's a comfy chair. I don't know how long I've had it though. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. Oops. I'm thinking about what I want to do. Um, tomorrow I won't be streaming because uh, I have class tomorrow. But then on Wednesday, what day is it today? Monday? On Wednesday I should be streaming. And then Thursday or Friday I'm doing Boomer Zoomer, Boomer and Zoomer. And then I have the upcoming podcast, the Grounded podcast. And then I have my stream with Dr. Inwood about the Canadian blood tran uh, blood donor scandal. And then I have my stream with um um see it's spamming uh, it's spamming it's not good. 
spamming the period key. That's from water damage, right? Is that is that fucked? Is my keyboard fucked then? I'll unplug it. That's not good. Where's the podcast? It's happening on here. The podcast is happening on here. So, yeah, that's good. It's all happening on here. Um, yeah, then the other is I'm going to be talking with Professor Taliaferro, Charles Taliaferro, who, and we're going to talk about Cartesian dualism and materialism in general. So, yeah. Uh, look, uh, if you enjoyed the stream and you want to help out, definitely subscribe, donate, whatever. I have my Patreon now that you can check out. Um, I won't be streaming tomorrow, but I'll be streaming on Wednesday. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, watching uh, this more confusing stream, I think. A bit rougher of a stream, I would say. Oh, oh my keyboard plugged in. That's right. Uh, but I will say that... Keyboard should be fine if you dry it out. Okay, cool. Uh, Wednesday, no, no, Thursday will, Thursday or Friday will be Boomer Zoomer or, or something like that. One of those things. Uh, but I will be updating on my Discord and my Twitter. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you enjoyed it, uh, donate. Check out Patreon if you want because you can get stuff on there. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you all for uh, tuning in and uh, hope you guys have a great rest of uh, your day. I'll play you out with some sick music. All right. Talk to you later, all. Goodbye. Bye.